chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, praise God for another day and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living Word of God. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Now, in our last lesson together, we left off at Mark, chapter 11, verse 24. Now, we've been talking from the subject, how faith works, fundamentals of faith or how faith works. We're dealing with the basic ingredients of the operation of faith. Now, we have said many things already concerning this subject, and uh, as we go along in a progressive teaching, it, uh, we cannot go back and say everything over and over again. But all of these messages are on cassette tapes, and you can get the previous messages so that you can have the whole lesson, and you can see it in its continuity, in its fullness. But we want to go on today and uh, continue on talking about how faith works. Now, in Mark chapter 11 and the 24th verse, we have what I consider to be the prayer of faith. If you ever wanted to know what the prayer of faith is, this is it. Mark chapter 11 Verse 24, it says, and Jesus is speaking, he says, therefore I say unto you. Now, let me clarify again. We, we pointed this out in our last lesson together, and that is the fact that you must realize who is doing the talking. Because so often, people will say, well, we don't believe it like that, Brother Price, in our church, or we don't teach it like that, or the seminary that I went to doesn't teach it like that. But we must always remember that the final ground of proof is God's word. Not my opinion, your opinion, or anybody else's opinion, but God's Word. Whatever the Word says, that's the way it are, is, okay? It doesn't matter what I think about it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. What matters is what does it say? What does it say? And so that's the final ground of proof. So we must always realize that if we accept this Word or we reject this Word, we do it on the basis that it is God's Word. Now, we have to make that assumption when we come to it, that it is the Word of God. Somebody says, yeah, Brother Price, but how do you know the Bible is true? Well, how do you know that it's not? How do you know that it's not? I'll guarantee you one thing, you won't find out the truthfulness of it by arguing about it. The only way you're going to find it out is to do what it says, put the principles into operation. If they work, then you write on ground zero. If it doesn't work, you can throw it in the garbage can and go on to something else. But the only way you'll know it is by doing what it says. If it works, you know you got it. I mean, if I've got a key and I go to my front door and I put the key in the lock and it doesn't open the door, that's proof positive I must have the wrong key. But if I take another key out, put it in the door and open the door and the door opens, I must have the right key. Don't need to argue about it. Dump the old one out, the one that didn't work, and use the one that does work. So I want you to notice here that this is Jesus Christ speaking, the Son of God, the head of the church. This is not Fred Price. This is Jesus Christ speaking. So you either accept it or reject it on the merit that it is the word of Christ, not my word, all right? Now, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, the first part of that verse that's important to us, and we dealt with this, I think, very conclusively in our last lesson, and that was the part where Jesus said, What things soever ye desire. What things soever who desires? I said, who desires? You. I can't hear that. You. What things soever who desires? You. All right, now notice, it's talking about your desires. It is not talking about God's desires for you. It's talking about your desires. Now, some people would balk at that immediately. And they would say, well, Brother Price, do you mean to tell me that God is desirous of us having our desires? Well, that's what the man said. He said, what things soever ye desire. It didn't say what things soever God desires for you. It said what things soever ye desire. So it's talking about my desires. It's talking about your desires. And then we gave you the illustration where somebody would say, well, bless, bless God, Brother Price, suppose I desire the wrong thing. Well, why would you want that? Well, I wouldn't. Well, then don't worry about it. Don't use that as a cop-out. And that's been a cop-out for years. People say, well, suppose I desire the wrong thing. Well, you don't have any business with the wrong thing. Why would you, a born-again, spirit-filled, blood-bought, blood-washed, saved person, ever desire anything wrong? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Well, then don't worry about it. You know, at least have as much confidence in you as God has in you. Hmm? Because he's the one that said what things soever you desire. 
Now, remember that all of this, of course, is predicated on certain principles, and we gave you several scriptures. We can't go into them now because of time, but remember we had you turn to the 37th Psalm and the fourth verse where it said, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Then we had you turn to John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 7, and John 15, 7 said, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Ask what ye will, not what God's will, but what ye will. And the reason that the Bible can afford to say that is because if you delight yourself in the Lord, the only way you can delight yourself in the Lord is by delighting yourself in his word. Because God is not here physically. You cannot see him, you cannot touch him, you cannot relate to him physically, but he has left his word here. And God and his word are one, just like you and your word are one. If I can't count on you, I can't count on your word. If I can't count on your word, I can't count on you. If this man tells me, Brother Price, I'll meet you at, cert at a certain place on a certain day at a certain time, and I say, all right, brother, I'll see you there, and then I get there and he doesn't arrive, and then he comes up and he says, well, Brother Price, I'm sorry, but something came up and, and some out-of-town guest came in or some, you know, some fanciful excuse. And he says, but uh, give me another chance. And so I go uh, the second time and, and the third time and then the fourth time. And he's never there when he said he's going to be there. It comes to a conclusion that his word is no good. I can't count on the man's word. If I can't count on his word, that means I can't count on him. You and your word are one. If I can't count on you, I can't count on your word. If I can't count on your word, I can't count on you. It's the same with God. I've never seen God, but I have his word. If his word is no good, that means he's no good. If his word is not true, and if it doesn't do what it says it'll do, that means God is not true, and that he doesn't do what he says. But God's word is God speaking to us. You follow what I'm saying? All right? So the principle is that if I delight myself in the Lord, the only way I can do that is by delighting myself in the Word of God. When I delight myself in the Word, I'm delighting myself in the Lord. So when I delight myself in the Word, then I am delighting myself in the Lord. And if I delight myself in the Word, I am going to know the will of God because the will of God is revealed in the Word of God. So consequently, I'm going to know what God has provided for me. I'm going to know what's right and what's wrong. And consequently, out of that, I would never desire something that would be inconsistent with a godly life that would be contradictory to God's plan and purpose for my life. Not only that, but I'm going to know all that God has provided for me. And when I find that out, I'm going to find out that he has provided more than I will ever need. Hallelujah. Then if I go to John and look at the 15th chapter in the 7th verse where Jesus says, if ye abide in me. See, there's the qualifier, if ye abide in me. Now, if ye don't abide in me, then all that he says after that won't work. But if ye do abide in me, then the other things will work. He said, if ye abide in me, and abide means to live in, settle down in, and take up residence in. And so he is saying, if you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will. Well, the reason that he can afford to give you such a carte blanche as that is because when you abide in the word, again, you're going to know the will of God. And if you are sincere about your commitment to Christ, you would never willfully desire anything that would be inconsistent with a godly life, nor would you desire anything that would take you away from the love of God, nor would you desire anything that would compromise your witness for Christ. You wouldn't want that. So then you don't have to be afraid of ever desiring the wrong thing. Can you see that? So there's no need to cop out with the devil's lie well, suppose I don't know whether, wh whether it's right or not. Well, praise God, if you know the word, you will know whether it's right or not. And then somebody says, yeah, but what, suppose I don't know whether the thing will hurt me or not. Suppose, I, suppose it's something that'll kill me. Suppose I desire something that would kill me and I don't know whether it will or not. Well, that's a sure sign you have no business with it. And like I said, I told you last time, I said, if you go down to the pet store and you want to buy a little pet for your kid, maybe a little fluffy kitten, well, if you can't tell the difference between tigers and kittens, you better get you a goldfish because you're in big trouble. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, why would you want something you don't know whether it's good or not? Huh? I mean, if you sat down to a table and somebody said, well, now some of this food on the table is all right, but some of it's got arsenic in it, how much of it would you eat? None, because you're not sure. Well, you ought to have that same kind of intelligence about anything else in your lifestyle to know whether the thing that you want or the thing that you get, whether it's good or bad. You wouldn't drink arsenic knowingly, would you? No, no, no. Well then, give yourself some credit for having some intelligence. God is giving you credit for having some intelligence. And he is expecting that if you walk according to his word, you're going to know what's right and wrong, what's good and bad, and you would never desire anything that's wrong for you. So then you, don't, you can't use that as a cop-out any longer. 
All right, now let's look at this verse again. Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray. Now notice the key there is when ye pray. Now we're talking about how faith works. And we're giving you now the principles to putting your faith into operation. And this verse here is the mechanics of how to put your faith into operation. You see, it's one thing to have faith. It's another thing to live by that faith. It's one thing to have faith. It's another thing to operate in it. If you don't know how it operates, it's impossible to operate in it. You may have it, but it won't do you any good. How many of you understand that? Can you see it? All right. So we're talking about how it works, the fundamental principles involved in the operation of faith. Now, Jesus is enunciating this for us right here. Now, notice. He says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, when ye pray, when ye pray, when ye pray, when ye pray. Now, notice he doesn't say what things soever ye desire before ye pray. He doesn't say what things soever ye desire after ye pray. He doesn't say what things soever ye desire after you understand something. He didn't say what things soever ye desire after you feel something. He didn't say what things soever ye desire after you know something. He said what things soever ye desire when ye pray. When ye pray. Well, when would when ye pray be? When you pray. That's right. But when would when you pray be? Now. now. Whenever you pray, it has to be now. I mean, I can't pray right now and it'd be tomorrow. I can't pray right now and it'd be yesterday. If I pray now, it will be now when I pray. That means what? Present tense. And that's what we found out about faith. Remember in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says now faith is. It says faith is now. Faith is. It doesn't say faith was, past tense. It doesn't say faith will be, future tense. It says faith is, present tense. Now faith is. All right, Jesus says when you pray. Well, when you pray would be now. So he's talking about exercising your faith when you pray. All right, now notice. He says, what things wherever ye desire when ye pray. So I know then that my desire is to be coupled with my prayer. At the very time that I pray, that is when my desire must be made known. The very moment I pray, that is when my desire is to be made known. When I pray. All right, notice. He says, what things wherever ye desire when ye pray. Now, he says, when you pray, believe... Believe. Oh, yes, Brother Price, glory to God. I believe. Oh, I believe that there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. I believe there's 66 in all. Oh, yes, Brother Price, I believe that the Holy Ghost came on the day of Pentecost and filled the 120 in the upper room. Yes, I believe that Jesus is coming back again. Wonderful. Marvelous. You should believe all of that, but not... When you are praying about your desires, that's not what you're supposed to believe. He tells us very clearly what we are to believe. He says, when you pray, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive. Believe that ye receive. Believe that ye receive them. Them what? Them things that ye desire. That's the understood subject here. That's what he's talking about, your desires. So he says, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Them refers back to the desires that you're praying about. Can you understand that? He says, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Now notice he didn't say see that you receive them. He didn't say understand that ye receive them. He didn't say, feel like you receive them. He just said, believe you receive them. Did you get that? Believe that you receive them. Just believe it. Well, Brother Price, how can I do that? Just the same way you do everything else you believe? Yeah, but how can I believe something if I can't see it? Well, I don't know why you do that all the time. You go in and you fill out an application for a job. And the man says, all right, we'll hire you. We'll pay you $300 a week for a 40-hour week. You start work next Monday morning. Come in, be here at 8 o'clock, and report to Mr. Bozo in the blah, blah department. So bright and early Monday morning, you come in. You're there, you're, you're there at 7.30. You're so, so happy about this job. You're there at 7.30. And so you go to the blah, blah department, and you ask for Mr. Bozo. 
So they introduce you to Mr. Bozo and he takes you to your place where you're going to work. And you start working. You work Monday, eight hours. You go home, you're just as elated and happy about it. You got a job. Hallelujah, you got a job. On Tuesday, you go back in again, you work another eight hours. Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. You've worked 40 hours. Now, you know what's happening on Friday? You're expecting something. You're expecting something. Oh, boy, you come in on Friday, and I mean to tell you, you're just wringing your hand. You say, oh, boy, this is the day. This is the day. Today is payday. How do you know it's payday? Well, the man told me when I hired him, he told me that if I work 40 hours, he said every Friday's payday. He said I'd get paid on Friday. Well, how do you know? Well, I believe it. Well, why do you believe it? Because the man told me. So did the man up there tell you. Why can't you believe him? Same thing. You believe that man, you, he, I'll guarantee you he didn't show you his checkbook. You don't even know if there's enough money in the company's account to pay the bill at the end of the week. But you trusted the man's what? Word. Now, you take the word of a man, perhaps a cigar-chomping atheist. <laughs> Doesn't even believe in God may be divorced, may be living with three women at the same time, immoral and everything else, but you'll take his word, and you don't ask him for a sign. You don't say, now, I'll tell you what, you show me a sign that you can pay me on Friday. <laughs> show me a sign. Let me see some of the last dividend checks you sent out to the stockholders, or, or let me see your checkbook or something. Give me, let me see the canceled checks of last month. No, you take the man at his word. You never question it, and not only that, but you go out and start telling everybody, praise God, I'm going to get paid on Friday. Praise God, I'm going to get paid on Friday. Woo, come and see me Friday. I have my money Friday. You haven't seen a dime yet. You're taking the man at his word. But isn't it interesting when it comes to the Almighty Father God, who hung the sun, moon, and stars in the heaven and keeps everything operating flawlessly. When it comes to God, you got to have a sign. Lord, show me a sign. Let a dog bark at midnight, Yankee Doodle Dandy, and then I'll know you want me to have this. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? See? See? You'll take men at their word, but when it comes to God, you got to have a sign. Why don't you ask that man at the work for a sign? Yeah, but he said he's going to pay me. And so did Jesus say, if you believe that you receive, you shall have it. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing. All right, now notice. Notice. He says, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Believe that ye receive them when ye pray. Believe that ye receive them when ye pray. Believe that ye receive them when ye pray. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them. Them what? Them things that ye desire. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. All right? Shall have is a future tense designation. See? Shall have is a future tense. It is future to the believing that ye receive when ye pray. Now, he said, when ye pray, believe that ye receive. That is what? Present tense. I have to do that the moment that I pray. Is that right? I said, is that right? Yes. I have to do that the moment that I pray. Not after I pray, not before I pray, but the very moment I pray, he said, believe ye receive. All right, that's present tense. Now, then he said, based on the present tense, he says the future tense will come into manifestation. He says when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have, and ye shall have them. Well, the very fact that he says ye shall have them means that ye don't have them now physically manifested because if ye had them now, ye wouldn't have to shall have them later. Did you get that or you want me to run that through again? Did you understand that? Now, that's a divine principle. I want you to get that. See, notice he says, when you pray, believe. That's right now, present tense. When you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, I'm going to see how spiritual you are. Now, look at the, look at the verse. Look at the verse. Now, let's, now, watch it very carefully. I'm going to read it again, and I want you to watch it very carefully. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray... Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. When ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. You got the picture? Okay. 
Now I'm going to ask you a question. Right here, sister. What did Jesus say you're going to have? What you prayed for, all right? What did Jesus say you're going to have? What thing soever ye desire, all right? What did Jesus say you're going to have? Right here in the yellow. Whatever you desire when you pray, all right? What did Jesus say you're going to have? Ah, whatever ye desire when ye pray now. All right, what did Jesus say you're going to have? The things you desire when you pray. All right. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say you're going to have? The things that you believe you're going to have when you pray. All right. Every one of you missed it. Every one of you missed it. What do you think? What do you think? What did Jesus say you're going to have? What did Jesus say you're going to have? Did you get it? Every one of you missed it. Now let me show you very carefully. See, that's how you get your mind on the desires and you miss how to get them. Now notice what he said. He said, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Jesus never said you're going to have your desires. Jesus never said you're going to have the things you pray for. Jesus never said you're going to have the things you pray for now. Do you know what Jesus said you're going to have? Jesus said you're going to have what you believed that you received when you prayed. If you didn't believe you received anything, you ain't going to get anything, and that's just why you haven't been getting anything, and it's why I didn't get anything for 17 years, because I never believed that I received anything when I prayed. I prayed, and I hoped that God heard my prayer, and I was a hoping and a praying that maybe someday in God's own good time, if it was according to his will, when he got around to it in his busy schedule, that maybe I would get it, and that's why I didn't get it, because I was not operating in the divine principle. And the principle is, when you pray, you have to believe that you receive it right then. And if you believe that you receive it, you know what you'll start saying? You'll start saying, praise God, I believe that I have received. I believe that I have received. I believe that I have received. You get it? But what happened, you pray about 55 times for the same thing. Don't you realize that if you believe that you receive that, you can't pray for it but one time? If you pray for it more than once, you're saying by the fact that you prayed the second time that you didn't believe you received it the first time because if you had in fact believed you received it the first time, why would there be any need to pray the second time since you already believe you have it? See, you thought that by the multitude of prayers that that would move the hand of God. But dear friend, I'm here to tell you it's faith that moves the hand of God. You only have to pray one time. I never pray about anything but once as far as petitioning God for something. Understand when it comes to the things that I desire, I never pray but one time and I get everything I ever pray for. Everything I've ever prayed for once since I found out how these principles work, I get everything I pray for and I only pray one time. As far as asking God for it or believing that I receive it. Follow what I'm saying? Now here's the way I do it. Let's say... That healing is what I desire, okay? My body's sick. I'm, 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 having, I'm being attacked by Satan. He's the one that brings sickness and disease. And so the attack comes on my body. And so I take the word of God, and you know, he told me, we already read it in John 15, 7, if we abide in him and his words abide in us, we shall ask what we will. Well, I abi I'm abiding in the word, so I found out that the word tells me that with Jesus' stripes I was healed. And so if I was, I am, and if I am, I is, and I believe that I is. Present tense. What things wherever you desire. So I go before the Lord and I say, Dear Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come before you now to make my request and my desire known unto you. You told me in your word what things wherever I desire when I pray. I am now praying. 
and I desire to be well from the top of my head to the soles of my feet to the tip of my toes. You said, when I pray to believe that I receive them, my desire is to be well, therefore I am now praying, and I believe, according to your word, that I now receive the healing of my body. I believe that I am healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet to the tip of my toes. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with how you feel. You may not have, there may not be any physical change immediately that you can be aware of. Notice that he never said anything about when you pray about your desires that there would be any physical change. He never said anything was based on what you saw or what you felt. He said it's based on what you believe that you receive. So I say, Father, I thank you. I believe I received my healing, and I want to thank you for it. I believe that I am now healed. Uh, the tumor may still be there. I may be able to reach and touch it and feel it. The tumor may be right there just like it was before I prayed for it. Let's say I pray on Monday, okay? Now, Tuesday comes. When I go to prayer again in my daily devotions, I say, Father, after I finish praying, I get to the end, I say, Father, I just want to put you in remembrance. I want you to remember, Father God, that on Monday I believe that I received my healing, and I just want to remind you, you told me in your word to put you in remembrance, and I'm just letting you know that I believe that I am healed. I received it on Monday, and I believe I'm healed now. All right, on Wednesday, I pray again, and I say, Father, I just want to thank you. And after I finish thanking him for all the other things, I say, Father, I just want to remind you. I just want to put you in remembrance. Your word declares that with Jesus' stripes I was healed, and I believe that I received that healing on Monday. And I just want you to know, Father, I believe that I'm healed now. See, I keep it in the now. See how I do it? I keep it in the present tense. Okay? There may not, have it, there may not be any physical change in my body. In fact, the tumor might be getting larger. Doesn't make, a th doesn't make a difference. Makes no difference at all. I don't look at what the things seen. We look at the things that are not seen. We found that out from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for or because the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So I don't look at the tumor. I look at God's word. And God's word says with his stripes, I was healed. And if I was, I am. And if I am, I is. And I believe that I is. Thursday comes. I go to prayer, and I say, Father, I just want to thank you. Just want to put you in remembrance. Just want you to know, Father God, that I believe that I have received my healing. I believed I received it on Monday. I believe I'm healed now, and I want to thank you for it. Friday comes. I pray the same prayer. Saturday comes. I pray the same prayer. Sunday morning comes now. I arise. I'm in my prayer time, and I remember that I'm going to thank God again for the fact that I believe that I received my healing last Monday, and I'm going to remind him that I believe that I'm healed now. And just by chance, I reach over there where the tumor was supposed to be, suddenly I realized the tumor ain't there no more. So then I begin to say, Father, I just want to thank you, Lord. I am healed. How do you know you're healed? Look at my body. My body proves it. The tumor's gone. Until then, my confession of faith is I believe that I'm healed. Why do you believe it? Because he said with his stripes, I was. And if I was, I am. And if I am, I is. And I believe that I is. That's how faith works. It is a matter of believing that it's done and confessing it with your mouth and acting to the extent that you can as though it were already done. That's what causes it to come. Once it comes, I don't have to believe it anymore. All right, question. Question. How many of you believe, how many of you believe that you're seated in this auditorium or you're watching on television and you're listening to Fred Price teach the Word of God? How many of you believe, how many of you believe it that you're here right now or looking on by television? Would you raise your hand? Now, you see that? Many of you raised your hand. Some of you, some of you have learned. Now, the, every, one of you, every one of you that raised your hand, let me ask you this question. Why would you have to believe it? Don't you know you're here? <laughs> Don't you know you're here? You only have to use your faith when you don't have the thing that your faith is the evidence of. And your faith takes the place of the thing until the thing gets there. Anything that you already have, you don't have to believe it. You know it. How many of you understand that? Can you, do you understand that now? See, I ask you, do you believe you're here? You ought to know you're here. Do you believe you're alive? You know you're alive. Do you believe this is your wife? You know that's your wife. <laughs> Do you believe you're seated here now? Know. You know it, exactly. Do you believe that this is a maroon colored suit? You know it, exactly. You see, you don't have to believe something 
relative to your faith operating on the promises of God. You never use, you never have to believe it when you have it. You only have to believe it until you get it. And it is the believing and the confessing of it that causes it to come. That's what faith is. Remember, we found out in Hebrews 11:1 1, that faith itself is the evidence. Faith is the evidence of the thing that I don't yet see or have physically. Once I get it physically, I don't have to believe it anymore. I know it. See the difference? All right. Now, this is the way that you operate. Now, let me point something else out here because there are many people who miss this principle. Now, notice what Jesus said. Jesus says, therefore, I say unto who? What things soever who desires? When who prays? I can't hear you. Believe that who receives them? And who shall have them? All right, now this is where a lot of people miss it with the things of faith. This scripture is not talking about me desiring something for this man. And that's where a lot of people miss it. They try to put off something on somebody else. That's not for this. This is not for that. This doesn't work that way. Notice very carefully, Jesus says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray... Believe ye receive them, and ye shall have them. It didn't say what things soever you desire when you pray, believe Fred receives it and Fred will have it. It didn't say that. It said what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have. You cannot make this work for somebody else. You cannot force this off on someone else. You can't go around praying stuff off on other people. Just because you have a desire for them to be saved, you can't pray that off on them. Just because you have a desire for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't force that off on them. Even though you desire for them to be healed in their bodies, you cannot force that off on them. This prayer has to do with you for you. Do you understand that? Now, if you want to pray for somebody else, there are other methods of prayer. For instance, the prayer of agreement. Matthew 18, 19, which says, if Two of you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. See, for them, that's plural. But here he says, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. It does not say what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe he receives them and he'll get them. How many of you understand that? So be very careful when you're exercising your faith. There is a way to pray for other people. Don't misunderstand me. But you can't just start confessing stuff for other folks. That's how a lot of people mess up in the things of faith, trying to put something off on somebody else and they don't want it. Yeah, Brother Price, but I know that she ought to be healed. That may be true. She may not want to be healed. There are a lot of people who don't want to be healed, friends. And you, need, you might as well wake up to the fact. Everybody that's sick doesn't want to be healed. I mean, folks been bringing them flowers and bonbons and visiting them. They, don't, they haven't washed a dish now in six months. <laughs> Friends are coming in, taking care of the house, cleaning up the house, taking care of the kids. Why, they're getting waited on hand and foot. They've never had that much attention in their life, and they're not about to give it up. <laughs> they don't want to be healed. You follow what I'm saying? So you can pray all day long. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I believe that she receives healing. She's not going to get healed because I pray that. Follow what I'm saying? This prayer has to do with you for you. It's not something you desire for somebody else. It will not work. Do you understand that? This prayer of faith here has to do with something for you. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe, you receive them, and you get them. I, I can't emphasize that too much. Because there are a lot of people running around praying, I'm going to pray this off on you, and I'm going to pray this off on you. You can't pray nothing off on anybody if they don't want it. God's not going to give something to you because I want you to have it if you don't want it. It's a matter of each individual's will. Now, if that person wants it, and maybe they don't know how to pray for themselves, and if they agree to it, then you can pray for them. And God, they can get healed on your faith. I've seen this happen all the time, many times. But they have to be in agreement on it. They have to desire it. They have to want it. I can't just indiscriminately pray for them, independent of finding out whether they want to be healed or not. 
Follow what I'm saying? That's the reason why I'm not real quick to just go pray for folks. Somebody's always wanting me to pray for somebody. Go to a hospital, go here and go there and pray for somebody. Just because they want the person healed, that dude may not want to be healed. I know people that don't want to be healed. They, I mean, they don't want to be healed. Don't intend to get healed. They're getting sympathy now, like I said before. Folks are sending them flowers. They're getting the kind of attention they've always wanted to have, and they got a good thing going, honey, and they're not going to give it up. Huh? You know what a job it is to take that, that bottle away from that baby and try to get that baby to drink milk out of a glass? You know, when you first start doing that, baby throws a fit, falls on the floor, hollers and screams, they don't want to give up that bottle. And then maybe you try, to, you try to be cool about it and make the switch from the bottle to the pacifier, and that's even worse, trying to get that passy away from them. And they'll hold on to that passy and sucking on that passy. <laughs> you try to pull that passy away, you got a war on your hand. Rah! They start crying and hollering. That's just the way it is with some folks, trying to take their sickness away from them. Huh? Trying to get their fear out of them or their power. Man, they want to be afraid. That gives them something to do. I mean, if they weren't afraid, what are they going to worry about now? Wouldn't have anything to worry about. Got to have something to worry about. I mean, everybody has to have something to worry about, don't they? Everybody but me, I don't worry about anything. I gave up all my worrying. Huh? I've been delivered from worry. I used to worry. Oh, I used to have my little worry things. I mean, I had them all categorically listed, you know, and I could worry, man, I could worry in technicolor. <laughs> huh? Oh, yeah, I could worry. I could worry with all the right kind of emotion. In fact, I had it down to a fine science. I could worry so thoroughly I keep myself awake all night, wouldn't even sleep. <laughs> but I gave all that up, and that, there's no hope in that. There's nothing in that. I just found out I don't have to worry anymore. Huh? I found out 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all my care on him, for he careth for me. I found out that the Bible says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And so I'm just resting in Jesus. I don't have any more worries. Just gave it up. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I have a lot of opportunities to worry, but I've just passed them all by. I send them down to your house now. I just don't keep them anymore. <laughs> all right, now watch. Notice, he says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, I want to show you something here about believe. Because there are a lot of people that do not understand the difference between certain words and the meaning of certain words. Now, there are certain words that have come down to us through history, through tradition. And those words have certain meanings to us. They, they carry certain connotation. When you hear a certain word, it reminds you of something. And sometimes there can be words that are spelled differently, that are pronounced differently, and yet, basically, they have the same meaning. You know, basically, they mean the same. There may be some differences, but basically, they mean the same. And yet, they are, the words are spelled differently, and they're pronounced differently. For instance, I could say, I could say, woman, female, mother, daughter. Now, all of those words are spelled differently. They're all pronounced differently. But they basically refer to the same species. Is that right? And yet the words are different. But in, in common thinking, you know, if I said daughter, you wouldn't think of a, a frog. If I said mother, you would hardly think of a man. Is that right? I mean, if I said daughter, mother, woman, female, you would think of the same species. Is that right? Female. All right. Just so in the realm of spiritual things, there are certain words that have come down to us through history and tradition that have connoted the same thing in our minds. In other words, they're different words. They are spelled differently. They are pronounced differently. But in the minds of most people, they mean basically the same thing. Case in point. Faith and believe. How many of you ever heard the word faith before? How many of you have ever heard the word believe before? Now, I want you to be honest about this. I'm not attempting to trick you. It is never my intention to trick you, but merely to get you involved in the teaching so that I can get the point across to you as clearly as it's possible for me to do it. Now, let me ask you this question. Up until this very moment, right now, that you hear me speaking to you, how many of you would be honest enough to say that you have always basically taken it for granted that faith and belief were basically the same thing? Just two different ways of saying basically the same thing. Anybody? Come on, get your hands up. Be honest. Get them way up, way up, way up, way up. Get them way up, get them way up, get them way up. All right, now hold, get your hand way up. Keep them up, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Now while you have them up, keep them up and turn around and look around. And you'll see all the other hands so you know you're not by yourself. All right. Now, that's where 
a lot of problems have come, come from in that Christians do not understand that faith is not belief and belief is not faith. Faith and belief are not the same thing. And if you don't understand the difference between the two, you can think you're exercising faith when in reality all you're doing is exercising belief. And I'll show you that you can believe something and get absolutely nothing for your believing. Believing won't get it at all. But believing is a part of it. But you have to get it in its proper sequential order or you'll miss out on what God wants to do in your life. Now, let me illustrate it this way. In my hand, I have what is called a 25 cent piece, a quarter. Now this piece of money is considered by the United States Treasury Department as legal tender. I can take this coin and I can trade it on the open economic market for goods or services. This coin on one side has the picture of one of our presidents. On the opposite side, this coin has a picture of an eagle with his wings outstretched, our federal bird. In common street language, the side with the bird on it is referred to as the tail side of the coin, and the side with the president's head is referred to as the head side, heads and tails. Now there is a difference, if you will look at the coin very carefully, there is a difference between the president's head and the eagle with his wings outstretched. And yet it is one coin, one coin, but it has two sides to it. Now as I said, the federal government decrees that this coin is considered legal tender and I can trade this coin on the open economic market for goods or services. However, it is required in order for this coin to be legal tender that both sides of the coin have to be intact. What do I mean? I mean that if I took this coin and put it on a grinding wheel and I ground off the president's head so that it's just a flat piece of shiny metal, if a shopkeeper or salesperson notices that, they are under no obligation to accept that coin as legal tender. Both sides of the coin have to be intact in order for the coin to spend on the open economic market. Just so God has a coin, and that coin will spend on the open spiritual market. That coin has two sides. It's one coin, but it has two sides. One side is faith or heads, and the other side is belief or tails. Heads and tails, faith and belief. Both sides have to be intact. If one side is missing, the coin will not spend on the open economic market. Now, let me show you that faith and belief are entirely different. Now, when you see this, this is going to help you out. This ought to be worth a million dollars to you. This, is, this was worth a million dollars to me when the Holy Spirit showed me this relationship. When I saw this, it made the difference in my life. It took me from poverty to wealth and from sickness to health. It took me from a point of being fearful in my life about many things to a point of unafraid of anything. In other words, it caused my life to be what God wanted it to be. Victorious, productive, and instrumental in helping others. Now, let us suppose that a man walks through the doors, walks down the center aisle, comes up here to the platform area, turns around and faces the audience. Now, immediately we notice that there's something very strange and peculiar about this man. He's very thin, very fragile looking. In fact, the guy looks like he's starving to death. He, he's so emaciated. He, he just looks like skin and bone. He looks so weak that many people feel that the poor guy may just fall apart any moment. Well, he raises his hand to gain the attention of the audience, and just as he opens his mouth and is about to speak, suddenly he crumples to the floor, just falls flat out on the floor. Well, the ushers rush to his aid, and we stretch him out here on the platform area when we try to revive him. Someone comes to the microphone and says, is there a doctor in the house? Well, there just happens to be a visiting physician who has his little medical bag, so he comes up here, and he examines this man. He comes to the microphone, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, this man is in the final stages of starvation. He has gone so long without nourishment and without food that given another 30 minutes, all things being equal, this man will die. He is that far gone. You got the picture? You got the picture? All right. So the ushers get together, and we confer together, and we say, hey, we can't let this man die on our hands. This would give a bad name to the church. Well, what can we do? Somebody comes up with the idea, 
well, let's call up the local catering service and see if we can get some food out here. So we get on a telephone, we call up the local catering service. In a few moments, we hear the screech of tires, and suddenly we see two men break through the door in white uniforms, pushing a little white cart. On top of that cart are all kinds of delectable goodies guaranteed to satisfy the most discriminating palate. By this time now, we have this man seated in a chair here. We wheel the little cart up with all the food on it. And I turn to this man and I say, sir, do you believe that if you eat this food, it will keep you from starving to death? And with indignancy written across his face, he looks at me and he says, why, when do you think I'm some kind of a fool? Certainly I believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. I absolutely believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. Positively, unequivocally, I believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. There is no doubt in my mind at all that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. I'm thoroughly convinced on the subject. There's absolutely no doubt, not even a shadow of doubt, that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. Now remember, the doctor said, all things being equal, that this man had how long? 30 more minutes to live. So 29 minutes, 59 and three quarter seconds later, this man is heard to say, I believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. I believe absolutely, positively, unequivocally that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. And he falls on the floor. The doctor rushes to his side, turns to the congregation and says, Ladies and gentlemen, this man is dead. You got the picture? All right, nobody talking out loud. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. And I'm not doing this to trick you or put you on the spot. I want to illustrate a truth to you. You got the picture. You got the story. How many of you believe honestly and sincerely that what this man believed was true? Raise your hand. It was true. How many of you believe it was true? All right, put your hands down. How many of you would have to say in all honesty and sincerity that what this man believed was definitely not true? Thank you. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. If, all right. How many of you would have to say at this point you're really not sure. <laughs> All right. Now, that's why we need to teach on this over and over again. That's exactly why you've been missing the blessings of God, because you didn't understand the principles of faith. Everything that that man believed was absolutely, positively, unequivocally, scientifically, and historically true that if he would eat that food, it would keep him from starving to death. Now, he might die of snake bite, but he wouldn't die of starvation if he ate the food. And yet, the man said he believed it, and there was food in front of him, and yet the man died. Why did he die? Aha! Uh -huh. He died because he did not eat the food. Is that right? Okay, that's the difference between faith and belief. The eating of the food is the faith part. It's acting on what you believe. It may be true, but if you don't act on it, though it is true, it will never do you any personal good. The man died. He said that he believed it. Food was in front of him, but he died. Why? Because he didn't act on what he believed. You see, you can believe in divine healing and die of a broken toenail if you don't know how to act on it. And that's exactly why many people, dear, lovely saints of God, who have been sick and who have been prayed for, still died. And we thought that because they died, that that must have been the will of God for them to die. Because we figured, we rationalized, that if it was God's will for them to be well, they would have been healed. So since they weren't healed, that's proof conclusively that it must not be God's will. The thought never entered their mind, did we miss something? Now, the reason they thought that was because they knew their own sincerity. They knew they were sincere when they prayed. See? They knew they believed God, but they misconstrued belief for faith. You see the difference? You can believe that God can supply all your needs. I did that for years. I believed that God was able. I used to quote the 23rd Psalm. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hallelujah. And I just loved that psalm. And while I was quoting it, I was in want. I kid you not. While I was saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I was wanting. Couldn't pay the light bill. Couldn't pay the gas bill. Had a hard time putting gasoline in the car. It was a struggle. Every step of the way was a struggle. Yet I believe God could do it, but he wasn't doing it. Not for me. And the reason he wasn't doing it is because I wasn't operating in his divine principle. I wasn't operating in the law of faith. And because I wasn't, it didn't work. And there wasn't anything God could do about it because he's already done it. He already gave me his word. He already gave me the laws and the principles to operate in faith. But the churches that I went to didn't teach me that. They didn't show me how to walk in the word of God. They showed me about a pie in the sky by and by over there after a while. I'm not interested in over there after a while. I'm interested in right here. Over there will take care of itself. I need to pay the bill now. The man's knocking at the door. He wants to build money now, not over there now. You follow what I'm saying? So you need to learn that faith is acting on what you believe. You say you believe the word. Oh, yes, Brother Price, glory to God. I believe it from Genesis to Revelation. Well, if you don't act on it, though you believe it, and though what you believe is true, it will never do you any personal good. It will never change your circumstances unless you start acting on the word. That's the reason why I say it. And I tell you, in the natural, you'll sound crazy to people. They'll sit up and criticize you. They'll call you everything else but a child of God. They'll say you're nutty as a fruitcake. They'll say you're crazy. They'll say you're fanatical. They'll say you've gone off the deep end. But I don't mind that. I'd rather be crazy, fanatical, and well than sane and sick. Oh, how's that grab you? I'd rather, be, I'd rather have all my needs met and be nutty as a fruitcake than be running around sane and don't have a dime in my pocket. Huh? Faith is acting on what you believe. How many of you drove a car here today? How many of you have the keys in your pocket or your purse or whatever? All right? When you leave here today, you go out to the parking lot or wherever you parked your car, you pull your keys out, climb up on the hood of your car, and shout it just as loud as you can so that every passerby can hear it. Shout it just as loud as you can. I believe that these are the keys to my car. And I believe that this is my car. And I believe that I can get in my car with my key. And I can start up my car. And I can get in my car and I can drive home. And I tell you, you'll be standing on the hood of that car until hell freezes over, until you get off the hood and get in the car and put the key in and start it up and drive home. You get it? Faith is acting on what you believe. That's why he said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. When you abide in the Word, and the Word abides in you, you're going to know what God has provided for you, for your life spiritually, soulishly, and physically. And you'll then begin to confess what the Word says instead of what the circumstances say, and it is the confession and acting on the Word that changes the circumstances. Praise God, the child of God is not a victim of circumstances. However, you will be a victim of circumstances if you don't learn how to operate in God's divine faith order. You will end up being a victim like I was for 17 years as a Christian. I mean, I loved the Lord. Oh, I loved him dearly. But I was a victim of the circumstances. And I thought that was the way life was supposed to be because everybody I knew as a Christian, they were having the same hard trials and tribulations that I was having. So I just concluded from that that this must be the way it is. And we just hold on, Tiger, and hang in there. And one of these days, by and by, over there on the other side, hallelujah, we'll get over there and we'll put on our long white robe. We'll walk to golden straits. We'll talk to Peter, James, and John. Ah! Man, that doesn't help me now. That doesn't help me now. That doesn't help me when I go in for, for a routine examination and the doctor sits across the desk with that grave look upon his face and tells me he's found a malignant tumor in my body and there's nothing they can do but send me home to die and the best they can do is give me six months. Man, I don't need something over there. I need something that'll work over here. And thank God faith will work. Thank God I can take God at his word and I can find the promises of God which says with his stripes I was healed. I can find it in the word of God where he says that himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. I can find it in the word where he says he's redeemed me from the curse of the law which is poverty, sickness, and spiritual death. I can find in the word where he says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty and I say praise God. I'm free in the name of Jesus. 
Hallelujah. 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 Well, listen. My time is just about gone. We're not finished with this lesson yet. And if this lesson has helped you and blessed you, I know that you probably want to get a cassette tape of the audio portion of this particular message and the other messages in this series. And so don't go away. Stay right there for the announcer will be telling you in just a moment how you can get your very own cassette. Now remember these words from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 where it says, For we walk...